In nearly 500 years ago, an unknown monk from a backwater town in Germany, he set in motion a movement that would literally transform Western civilization. His name was Martin Luther. You know, I love what he said. He said, I never thought such a storm would rise out of Rome over a simple scrap of paper, but it did. Because he set free the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that had been held captive for nearly 1,200 years by a church and by a book. Five hundred years ago, the people of Europe were under the domination of a, a very powerful religious empire, the Roman Catholic Church of the 16th century, an empire that controlled every aspect of a person's life. Uh, it could raise you to glory or condemn you as a heretic and burn you alive. So the church at that time had evolved or grown into this institution which was quite intimidating for the average person. The entire mass was done in Latin and the people didn't really know what was going on. They had memorized parts of it without really understanding what the parts meant. They just knew this was big, important, special stuff. But actually understanding what was being said, not really. Books were still rare. You could have an entire church that might not have an actual Bible in it. You would have maybe outtakes or little parts of it, but a full Bible was, was not common. Death is something people encounter all the time. To get through infancy was a significant accomplishment. People spend a lot more time thinking about what's next, and it was not a happy thought for most people. Martin Luther was the son of Hans and Margareta Luther. He was born November 10th, 1483. He was baptized the very next day. Children were baptized as soon as possible after birth because you just didn't know if a child was going to live. Infant mortality rates were huge in those days. And he ends up being named Martin Luther because he's baptized on St. Martin's Day. Uh, Hans had been a minor. Uh, he became an entrepreneur when Luther was very young. So Hans had dreams of not only moving from the agricultural peasantry into the mining industry, he had dreams of moving his son into the bureaucracy, where there was more money, more security, more power. And so he had a, a vision for the Luther family that, that was on the move, upward and onward. There was no such thing as social security in those days. Your social security policy or your insurance policy for your old age, as it were, was your children, specifically your sons. And so Hans had big ambitions for his second son, Martin. He had designs on making him into a lawyer. The Luther family moved from Eisleben to Mansfeld, and Martin Luther went to elementary school here and primarily was a Latin school. And later, Luther would record the fact that in one morning he was caned or disciplined somehow 15 times for not having prepared his Latin lesson correctly. You know, people sometimes have these rather um, nostalgic, you know, views of, oh, wouldn't it be have been great to live in the 16th century? You know, life was hard then. Even the attitudes of society were, were very difficult and, and, and rather harsh. Everything in those days was pretty strict in terms of the upbringing of young people. The church was strict. His parents were very strict. As a matter of fact, Luther later said that his concept of God the Father was somewhat influenced by the fact that his own father was very strict and he wasn't sure how much he loved his father at that point after getting disciplined. For small offenses in the civil realm, there would be rather harsh punishments. And this is part of what Luther grew up with. He, he recollects, as he got older, you know, being punished by his parents sometimes for stealing a nut. And he said the blood flo flowed from the punishment he got. And the same thing he would experience in the schools. Just, it was, it was a harsh sort of world. The image they had of Christ was the image from the, from the apocalypse of St. John. Christ in, in glory. Christ in judgment and coming from his mouth would be the lily on the one hand and the sword on the other hand. And the lily of God's mercy and God's forgiveness, but the sword of wrath and judgment. So the burning question was, how do I avoid the sword and get the lily? Well, the church had the answer for this. And the answer, interestingly enough, came down to something you could put in the form of a slogan, 
which was actually preached from pulpits. Do what is in you. Do what is in you and God will not refuse you grace. At least do the best you can. So God gives his grace and I use that grace and I accomplish what God wants me to do. But what happens if I mess up? Well, there's an answer for that too. I go to church and at church, I would meet the priest one-on-one -on -one and I would confess to him. And that would open the rite of penance, which would be I confess and then he gives me some kind of satisfaction to perform, something that needs to be done to show that I have a truly penitent heart. It might be a Hail Mary, it might be a more rigorous kind of action, or it might be a suggestion that I could give a donation to a certain cause. And if I would go and do penance, then I could be assured I was forgiven for that particular sin. So it was very, very carefully worked out system. This amount of sin, this amount of penance, everything's right again, you're back on track and away you go. Now, what if I don't do enough penance? What if I don't quite cover all the sin? The answer is some time in purgatory. And so you die, you're not quite good enough for God yet, but you're on the right track. We're not gonna send you to hell, that wouldn't be right, but you can go to purgatory and in purgatory, we'll get you cleaned up or God will get you cleaned up. So purgatory is not pleasant. You're, you're suffering in purgatory. You're sweating off your sins. And so I finished paying for all of my sinful behavior. And when I finally have paid every last bit in purgatory, then, then I'm ready now for the next step. And then I can walk into God's presence. But it was a very careful system. And all the way along, it's God's grace that's making this happen. And it's you that's doing it. You're the one earning the forgiveness. You're the one paying the price. You're the one accomplishing it. So the, the onus is on you to make sure it gets done. Now, this was the religion that Luther grew up with. And after he completed what we would call high school, he was recommended for the University of Erfurt. Luther received his bachelor's degree after about a year of study at the University of Erfurt. And then after about another two and a half, almost three years, he gets his master's degree. And now the master's degree was kind of a general purpose degree. It wasn't in a particular subject yet, but it enabled somebody who wanted to go on in higher education to move on to one of the higher faculties, which were only three in those days, medicine, law, or theology. But something is going on in Luther's life. While he's studying at the University of Erfurt, he noticed a great bound copy of an old book in the library, and it turned out to be the Holy Bible in the Vulgate Latin translation. Uh, he had heard readings from the Bible before, but never realized they all even came from the same book, because in those days, the Bible was regarded as a very dark and obscure document, which only the clergy could properly interpret. Now remember, Luther is born right at the advent of the printing press's discovery, but it was still in its infancy and b books were still rare. If you had a book, it meant somebody had to hand copy that book. And so Bibles, they're very expensive because you had to copy every single line of every single Bible by hand. But in Luther's time growing up, there were, there were Bibles that were very rarely found. Luther was very much aware as were all Christians at the time that the church said, now you need our help in order to be able to understand this. You need guidance, expert guidance to interpret this very mysterious book. But there were other events in Luther's life that focused his attention on the hereafter. In 1503, he was paying a visit to his parents, leaving Erfurt and going back to where they were, and he sustained a, an injury from a sword that pierced an artery going into his leg. Uh, and bled profusely, uh, which uh, was a very frightening occurrence for him, uh, it reinforced a fear of death. Uh, I say reinforced because fear of death was very, very widespread at that time. You have to remember that death could come very suddenly. You could get sick in the morning and be dead by evening from some sort of bug. Uh, plagues regularly went through cities. Uh, women died in childbirth. Uh, death was much more a part of the daily consciousness in that time than it is now. And so when Luther accidentally stabbed himself, it was simply reinforcing a fear of death that was already there. Luther did recover, but there were other occasions in which uh, a friend of his named Alexis, for example, died. And Luther again wondered, what if I were Alexis? Uh, two of his colleagues in Erfurt died of the plague at the time. And so here this young student was looking way ahead into the future and the life to come 
early on in life. On July 2nd, 1505, Luther's coming back from visiting his parents, back on his way to Erfurt. He's only been in law school for, oh, about six weeks or so. Not very long by the time he took his leave of absence. And there's a thunderstorm that comes up. He is frightened for his life standing out there and the lightning and the thunder. He cries out, Saint Anne, help me, I will become a monk. And as somebody once said, well, she did. And he did. And it was goodbye to law school. About two weeks after that great experience at the thunderstorm, Luther basically dispossesses himself of all of his possessions, including a very expensive law book that his dad had gotten him as a graduation present for his master's degree graduation, and goes into the toughest monastery he can find there in Erfurt, that of the observant Augustinians. He entered an Augustinian monastery uh, and uh, did indeed uh, take a vow, which he later admitted was uh, made under duress and uh, was not sincere, but it was a vow that he took and he felt he needed to complete. And the late medieval people were very concerned with their destination after death, and Martin Luther shared that concern. And so his decision to enter a monastery was motivated, at least in part, by this concern for what would happen to him after he died. And he believed, as was common at that time, and as the church encouraged, that going to a monastery, becoming a monk, would give him a better chance, a better chance of a happy result after he died. You know, obsessed by guilt and the fear of damnation, Luther was trying in vain to find assurance of his salvation. I, I love what he said. He said, I was a pious monk. You know, if ever there was a monk that got into heaven over monkery, I would have gotten there. So as Luther was entering into manhood, he was, he was literally running away from the world, um, hiding in the monasteries, trying to find peace with God. But the book, the book that he found in the University of Erfurt, at first it would torment him, but later it would bring him to the realization that would change the world. But once he got into Rome and he was doing the various things that a religious pilgrim would do in Rome, he got less and less enchanted with the city of Rome. In fact, later on he said, boy, if, if there's a hell, Rome is built on it. 